Welcome to episode 282 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak encouragement into the hearts of educators and get you informed and energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm wrapping up the three-part podcast series I did this summer of personal reflections and sharing what's ahead for me and what I see for the future of schooling. Visit truthforteachers.com for an easy to read, easy to share version of this podcast episode. Earlier in July, I hosted the first ever online summit entirely focused on saving teachers time. If you missed out, no worries, it's not too late to get access. The 40 hour teacher work week online summit features more than 30 teacher led sessions, sharing practical ideas for streamlining and simplifying your workload. The sessions are just 15 to 20 minutes each, and there's no fluff, filler, or product sales. Each presenter is a member of my 40 hour program and a current classroom teacher, sharing their day-to-day habits that help them stop working endlessly on nights and weekends. You can purchase forever access to all the sessions, roundtables, and the three keynotes I conducted for the summit, meaning you can watch and rewatch on demand whenever it's convenient for you. You'll also get detailed summaries, note-taking guides, full transcripts, and more bonuses. Just go to join.40htw.com forward slash summit, or click the link in the show notes to get your forever access pass to the 40 hour teacher work week online summit. So here we are at the end of my three part series this summer that I did on the podcast, sharing my personal story. I have revealed in episodes 278 and 280, a little bit more about Um, my childhood, my upbringing, the experiences that shaped my thinking and kind of made me who I am as a person. So I've shared a lot of stuff that I've never talked about publicly before. And I have to say the responses so far to this series have been so heartwarming and supportive and affirming, and I just feel very seen and understood. So thank you all for that. Thank you for the people um, who, who reached out and and shared that they could relate or that they appreciated um, my attempt to be thoughtful in sharing some things that are, you know, can be divisive, can be difficult to talk about, can be alienating. Um, you know, it, it felt really important to me to to tell you more about my backstory. And so many of you said that you've enjoyed that. So thank you for that. Um, so I thought I might do an Ask Me Anything episode after this, an AMA. So I created a Google form. It's anonymous. It's just one question. If there's something that I've shared here, or maybe I didn't cover that you're curious about, um, you can stick it in that Google form. It's linked in the show notes for this episode, as well as the blog post for it. And I will answer those questions in an upcoming episode for you. I want to focus in this episode about what is next for me, what I have planned, what I'm excited about, and what I'm working on. And I want to lead into this topic by sharing with you a one-star review that I received for this podcast recently. The title of this review is Out of Touch with Today's Teacher. And here's what the review says. How long ago was Angela in the classroom? Why would you give advice to teachers when you couldn't even handle being in the classroom before? She has no idea what it's actually like now. It's time for Angela to find something new. Now, every now and then I get constructive feedback from a kind soul who is uh, in one of my programs or has read one of my books or listens to the podcast, usually via a private message or an email. And they say, maybe you haven't considered this. Or here's something else that you might not be aware of. Or I feel like you might be missing this piece. And I appreciate that feedback because it's clearly designed to help me continue learning and growing. It's not just assuming that I'm out of touch. I don't know what to do with a review like this because it's anonymous. I have no way to reply to it. I have no idea what episode they listen to. But apparently it was so bad that this person felt like it was time for me to move on and do something new. Now, I understand 
the root of this complaint. I understand the deep frustration over how many people who are not in the classroom are telling teachers how to do their jobs. It is really frustrating. But for an anonymous stranger on the internet to write that it's time for me to do something else is just something that shocked me because I've never heard feedback like that before. I mean, do something else other than my life's work, other than the career that I've dreamed about since I was a little girl. I've always wanted to be a teacher, to be in education. I've spent decades learning skills and studying best practices. Teaching is one of my biggest passions. It's something that I've just been practicing for years in so many different capacities. So this idea that there's only one area of expertise that counts, only classroom teachers have something of value to add. I feel like it's just, it's reactionary. It's a pendulum swing the other way from teachers having no voice, no autonomy, no professional consideration into what they do in their classrooms to the only people that I'm willing to listen to are other teachers. And I think the wiser approach is somewhere there in the middle. So this is something that I've been thinking about for quite a long time, even before this review. And the conclusion that I've come to is that even if I was still in the classroom, I would be in my classroom. I still wouldn't be in yours. So if I was still teaching third grade in South Florida, for example, I still wouldn't understand what it's like to teach kindergarten in Texas. I wouldn't know what it's like to teach earth science in Oregon at the high school level. I wouldn't know what it's like to be a special educator at a private school in the Northeast. The way that I've had more insight into other classrooms is through instructional coaching and consulting of working in schools across the country and with countless teachers online. That's how I've gained more insight into the commonalities the different challenges, the different solutions, what's working in different places. And I wouldn't trade those experiences for anything. All the trainings and research and observations and coaching and mindset work, all of the productivity research I've done since leaving the classroom has given me insights that I wouldn't have otherwise. That personal and professional development work over the last few decades has tremendous value. At least I think it does. So this is me announcing that, no, I'm not going to go do something new. I've never been able to help all teachers. There's no possible way for me to be relevant for everyone. But as long as I'm still helping some people, as long as there are still some people who are benefiting from my lived experiences, my insights, my studies in about curriculum and instruction and pedagogy, the work that I've done on learning mindset strategies and productivity strategies and translating them to school-based practice, the work that I've done around neuroscience and everything that I've learned about how the brain learns. These are things that I didn't know when I was in the classroom and I wouldn't be able to experiment with, research and learn so much about if I was still in the classroom because the majority of my time and energy would need to be dedicated to my students. And instead, I feel like it's dedicated to my teachers, to you. As long as a person is still learning and growing and sharing what they're learning, I feel like that's relevancy. So let me share a little bit more about what I have planned. Um, I'm going to give you one thing that is happening now, and I'm going to give you one thing that is still just a dream, just a vision but it's something that I'm working toward. And I feel like the visioning is an important part of it. I've never talked about it publicly before, and I'm gonna invite you into that dreaming and visioning with me now. So the first thing that I want to focus on in the next couple of years or over the next couple of years is findingflowsolutions.com. This is the set of curriculum resources that I am creating to help students with time management, attention management, and energy management. It's based on Mihai Cheek Set Mihai's research on flow theory. And flow is that peak human experience where 
you are so engaged in the task that you lose track of time. Um, Just everything else falls away and you're completely absorbed in what you're doing. And that's an experience that I think we all want to have more in our work, right? Like as teachers, that's the best feeling. Um, And as students, it's a really good feeling too. And they don't always get to experience that in school. I think that's a lot more motivating to aim for our flow state than it is to just think about, okay, how do we manage our time? How do we be more productive? How do we get more work done? I really want to recenter joy um, through this curriculum, enjoyment, um, satisfaction, tapping into intrinsic motivation, not necessarily that's tied to the subject area, because that can be really hard. It's, it's hard sometimes to make your content connect directly to students' interests. So what if we teach them what to do when they find something boring? What do you do when you need to turn in an assignment and you just can't get motivated to get started? What do you do when you're stuck and you just don't feel like you can push through? Um, I think that there are things that we can teach our students about how their brains work that is just really exciting and motivating. So if you want to hear more about that, I did a podcast episode on it um, just a few episodes back called Finding Flow, How to Teach Productivity Strategies to Students. And I released the first set of that curriculum this past spring um, designed for secondary teachers. And the response to it just blew me away. I mean, this was what I heard back from teachers was this is exactly what my students need. And that even just with the with the first free unit that I that I gave away, just teaching kids about what flow is, they noticed a difference in their kids right away. And that was very encouraging to me because this was like early May. And we all know kids are not motivated to learn anything, especially like high schoolers in May. (laughs) It's so close to the end of the school year to get them to engage and pay attention to anything is really tough. So the fact that, you know, just this this beta launch um, at the end of the school year was really making an impact for kids was very motivating. So um, I'm just really excited to work on that. This is something that I'm really, really passionate about. I'm um, really well researched in. And I'm excited to take what we know about neuroscience and productivity research and apply it to um, what happens in the classroom with students. You know, I feel like throughout the 20 years that I've been sharing teaching resources online, the the heart of my work has always centered around a big problem that I was trying to solve. In the early years, it was classroom management. So when I first created the website in 2003, it was stuff like, you know, how to manage passing out papers, how to, you know, line kids up without it being total chaos and taking 20 minutes, um, stuff like that. Um, the, the things that I felt like weren't in teaching textbooks and that teachers weren't really trained in, and we were all just kind of figuring out on our own. So I was really thinking about classroom management. I wrote my first book on classroom management. And then I felt like that was really too limiting. And it started to feel more like it was control-based rather than student-centered. Like I, I do feel like classroom management as a term even has fallen out of favor now. Um, it's something about like managing students that is just kind of a turnoff. Um, But I just felt like it was more than that anyways, because I could share what to do. But if you had a defeatist mindset, or if you didn't believe your kids could do it, or if you didn't have the confidence to say it with authority and and back up what you were saying and, and, you know, um, enforce what you were saying to kids and and have that kind of um, presence in the classroom with kids, then it wasn't going to work. And I realized a lot of that was about mindset. It was about the way that you think and how that impacts the way you show up in the classroom. So that's when I wrote Awakened. I wrote the Awakened devotional. I started really getting into mindset stuff. And then once I felt like I had kind of said my piece on that and and gone as far as I felt like I needed to go in terms of translating that mindset work to um, to school based contexts. I started to realize, um, particularly through instructional coaching, 
that one of the biggest barriers now, you know, we've got the classroom management, we know how to do the practical stuff, we've got the mindset piece, but the time issue was still there. Every single year, teachers were being asked to do more and more, and they just didn't have time. There was too many things to do, and they didn't know what to prioritize. And they were always working, and they were never done, and they never felt like they'd done a good enough job. And that's when I created 40 Hour. So I've spent, you know, really like the last eight years really focusing on productivity, including writing Fewer Things Better, the courage to focus on what matters most. Um, you know, that book really is about the mindset behind productivity. So it's, it's sort of tied those two things together. And um, that leads me to what I think will probably be the big problem that I'm trying to solve over the next few years, which is attention management. So if the response continues to be what it seems like it's going to be, I can see myself working on this for years to come because uh, I have a lot of different ideas for a lot of different resources. And I would like to create something that goes maybe not K-12, but at least like grades 2 12. I'm still thinking over that whole thing, but um, that's definitely an important part of what I see as my legacy because I want to take away some of the guilt and shame around productivity that I think so many kids and teachers are experiencing, just feeling like they're not doing enough. You know, their work is not good enough. They have too much to do and they don't know how to push themselves through. And it just, the whole thing just starts to get demoralizing after a while. And I just want to offer a more optimistic, positive, and again, joyful approach to work. So finding flow solutions is definitely something that I want to be focusing more about, focusing more on. Um, Another thing is um, I want to focus more on the podcast and on my email list and less on social media. So I've been experimenting over the past year or so with just posting less on social media. You know, I've never been prolific because it kind of goes against my fewer things better principle. You know, I don't want to be the person who is talking about work-life balance, but just constantly shoving teaching resources in your face, you know, and, and posting 50 times a day on Facebook. Like I just, I, that just isn't me. But I've also found that social media is um, just really exhausting because of the algorithms. That that's the main problem. I mean, you know, if you're on social media and if you're not on social media, you also know <laughs> the reasons why people don't like it. There's a there is way more to it than that, but the main thing for me as someone with a public Facebook page, public Instagram, public TikTok and Twitter is that um the algorithm algorithms really limit what people see. And that is just so frustrating. I don't want to do reels. I don't want to make videos about everything. I'm a writer. Like, that's how I like to communicate. And, um, you know, I just, I don't like to have to play those games to try to get reach when I feel like people liked my page because they like my page. They want to hear from me. So why not show them my stuff? And that's just not how algorithms work. You know, they feed on outrage and controversy. If you get people riled up, you know, and, um, you know, experiencing strong emotions, they will comment back and forth to each other. They will leave a comment and they will respond to other people's comments. And that is the way that Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram define engagement. If people are commenting and, and having discussion, then it must be relevant and interesting. So if I were to post an article about you know, teachers quitting and how horrible the working conditions are, it would arouse strong emotions in people, people would comment on it, they would be talking about it in the discussion, and it would probably show up in your feed. However, I have made a commitment right around the beginning of COVID, so it's been for like the last three years or so, to not use social media in that way very often. Um, And that is simply for my mental health and for the mental health of the people who follow me. I am glad that there are people who are discussing unpleasant and difficult things on social media. I did that for many years, and I am done with that as of now. <laughs> Can't say it will always be that way, but that's how it is right now, because I, f- I feel like it has gotten so deeply unpleasant 
to be in online spaces now. Um, and I just don't want to contribute to that. When you see something from me in your feed, I want it to be something that makes you laugh or smile or makes you think or makes you feel less alone that inspires you. And the sad part is, is that's just not the stuff that is surfaced in the algorithm. The algorithm runs on hot takes. And that's another thing that I have committed to not doing is, is not commenting on current events as they're happening. To hear a, one snippet of something and then immediately feel like I must have an opinion on it. And I must have a strong opinion on it. And I must immediately rush to social media and post about that strong opinion, <laughs> despite not having all the information, despite not having had any time to process it, which is extremely important for me. I'm a deep thinker, and I like to have time to put all the puzzle pieces together and look at things in different contexts and you know, look at the problem from different angles and, and make new connections. You can't do that in a split second, right? It takes time. And I don't want to just rush online and start talking about things that I don't know anything about. And there's a lot of pressure to do that when you have a public social media challenge to, um, you know, to speak out on every awful thing that is happening. And I've just committed to not doing that. I've committed to, um, to processing these things. I'm not shutting them out, but I'm processing them in my own way and then thinking about what can I put out into the world that will address this in some way. So maybe, you know, there's some particular current event and I'm thinking, oh, I should interview someone on my podcast about that. And we'll do a deep dive 45 minute episode, you know, really like what is the problem? What are the solutions? What are things that we can do? What is the mindset that we should have around this? That's much more my style than like, let me just like hop on social media and just say, you know, this is outrageous. This shouldn't be happening. Something has to change. That is just not how I want to use social media. And because of that, um, it's harder to get posts seen. And it makes me sad because our Truth For Teachers Writers Collective is constantly putting out new articles. There's so many good articles at truthforteachers.com that they have written. But if I try to share them on social media, they will get seen by no one because it's my own website. If I share a link to someone else's website, then Facebook or Twitter, Instagram will, you know, usually give that a little bit more traction. But if you try to share the link to your own website, they want you to pay for it. So they will halt the interaction on that, like not show it to very many people, hoping that you will boost the post or turn it into an ad and put money behind it, and then they'll show it to people. So it's like I have these wonderful resources to share with you to help you that you have signed up to see because you're following me on social media and you're not seeing them. And it's just so frustrating. So the things when I really think about like what is most rewarding for me and what is most impactful for me in terms of sharing ideas and connecting with people, I think the podcast feels really valuable. I mean, I'm, it's sort of a one-way broadcast tool, which makes me a little sad, but we do have the Truth For Teachers um, podcast Facebook community, which I've also put on the back burner. I haven't even posted there in like a year, but my plan is this fall to kind of get that group going because there's almost 10,000 teachers in there. And um, it just, it got to the point where, again, the algorithm wasn't showing people my posts and the group just sort of like died off. But um, I think that's a great place to discuss these episodes. And I would just, I would love to interact more with teachers about the stuff that I'm talking about on the podcast. Um, I get a lot of DMs on Instagram and um, on Twitter from people who are like, hey, this topic was so interesting. You should, if you liked this, you should also read this book, or maybe you should listen to this podcast episode. And they point me towards other resources and it's just, it's fabulous. So um, I, I'm looking for ways to make the, the podcast more interactive, basically, to hear back from you all more and to learn and grow with you. because. Most of these episodes, I'm just sharing the stuff that I'm thinking about. It's what I'm learning. It's what I'm experimenting with. It's what is something that matters to me. And to hear back from you all about what you care about, um, it just makes it even more rewarding. So I've, I'm still continuing to really enjoy the podcast. This has been going now since 2015. And um, I just, I love it. So podcast is not going anywhere. And the other thing is the email list. Um, what I like about the email list, so this is what would have been called like a newsletter back in the day, right? 
So I send out typically um, one email a week. It's on Sunday evenings. It's something that I write myself. Um, It's usually a message right from the heart. It's letting you know about something new that I've created or something that I've been thinking about or some resource that I have. Um, And I I really enjoy the email list. We've got about, I think around 100,000 people on there. And it feels like such an honor to me to get to write something that lands right in those people's inboxes. Because, you know, Facebook may or may not show you my post. TikTok may or may not let my video surface in your For You page. But if you've subscribed to my email list, you're going to get my email every single time. And it's up to you whether or not you read it. But at least that's a decision that you get to make versus an algorithm. And it's also long form, which is what I prefer. I don't like just writing like quick social media captions. I feel like, you know, again, going back to the whole attention span thing, right? Like, we went quick, quick, quick videos and short captions. And that's just not my style. I mean, that's why I like the podcast because I can go deep. I mean, the kind of stuff that I've been sharing in this three-part podcast series, I would never put this on social media. Are you kidding me? Like some of the stuff that I've talked to you about on this podcast, I didn't even transcribe these episodes because I don't want it written out on my site. I don't want it searchable in Google for people to like look this stuff up and like twist my words and misinterpret you know, what I'm saying or or make judgments about me. The podcast is a place where I can just speak really honestly to you. And because I have your full attention for, you know, 20, 30, 45 minutes, I mean, that is just, that's so powerful. That's so much more of a deeper connection than you just reading like an Instagram um, caption. And so, and that's what I like about the email list too. Like reading an email is less personal, obviously, than listening to a podcast, but not everyone has time for podcasts and not everyone likes podcasts. Um, the email is, you know, it's shorter. It takes, I don't know, maybe two minutes to read. Um, but I feel like I can say more. And again, I just love that it goes right to people's email inboxes. So email list and podcast, which kind of feels old school now <laughs> at this point, um, until I find something better. You know, I mean, I've, having shared teaching resources online now for two decades, I have seen stuff come and go. We had was it Google Plus? That was one. Um, there's been so many. We had Periscope on Twitter. Like there, there's been so many different things that have come in and out um, of social media trends. And I'm open. I'm open to whatever comes next. You know, I've really made a decision that I want to be discerning about new developments and how the world changes and new ideas, new technology. I'm not gonna, I've never been like an early adapter who just is like the first one to jump on board with things. Typically, that's not me. I like to wait and watch and think, reflect a little bit before I get involved. But I do want to be open to stuff. And when something new comes along, like when podcasting first came along, I was like, yeah, I want to try this. So for now, I think email and the podcast are going to be my two main areas of focus. But um, I'm hoping that more cool things are invented, more awesome ways to connect. So in the meantime, if you are not on my email list, what I send on Sunday nights on the email is not necessarily related to this podcast. I don't just send out an email saying new podcast episode. It's usually about something different. So if you want to get that email, click the link in the show notes or go to truthforteachers.com and you'll see a sign up thing right at the top of the page. Um, And hopefully you're already subscribed to the podcast. So those are the two main ways you can stay in touch with me. So the other thing that I wanted to share with you that I'm just still dreaming about for the future, and that is holding teacher retreats. I would love to offer an affordable experience for teachers to be able to get away for a weekend with other teachers who understand their stressors and understand the emotional labor that they carry um, and have a chance to just rejuvenate, to reconnect with themselves and what matters to them. And This is something I've been thinking about for a really long time. 
And then just when I was thinking about actually like starting to make some move towards it, COVID happened. And I was like, okay, so we're not doing anything that involves travel and in person. Mm -mm. <laughs> but now I feel like we're kind of getting to the place now where that could be feasible again. And, um, you know, I'd like to pick a, a location that is drivable for a lot of folks, you know, and the idea is you would just drive in on, on Friday evening and maybe there's a big house that I've rented and um, we all stay in this house together and I have it catered so we have good food and you don't have to think about food or hotel or anything like that. And there's just a combination of like structured time, like structured personal development and alone time, a chance to just be with your friends or be by yourself, a chance to sleep um, and then leave on Sunday evening feeling encouraged. So, um, you know, I've been developing a lot of skills over the last couple of years that I feel like really lend to that. For many years, teaching was my hobby and creating teaching resources was my hobby. So making curriculum and designing resources for teachers. I mean, even the podcasting, you know, creating stuff for 40 hour members, that was what I did for fun. And it's really only been, I think once I turned 40, something shifted in me where I wanted to rediscover parts of myself that I felt like had been neglected for a long time. And one of the things um, that I've been sort of like developing in myself is um, conducting sound baths. So I am certified to do sound therapy now. Um, I did a podcast series, I think 2019, where you got to hear me play the kalimba, which is the African thumb piano, um, and the koshi chimes and all that kind of stuff. So there's a whole process that you can do that is designed to downregulate their nervous system through these sounds and creating these sound experiences. And I have the instruments, I have the training. I would love for that to be like an optional activity for anyone who wants to do it. Um, I have also gotten certified um, for art therapy and th not like any kind of like, you know, PhD or anything like that, <laughs> uh, but just an online course that I took um, that that kind of taught me more about how to do that, about how to um, help people express themselves and um, tap into those deeper emotions and bring them out through art. So art is something that I've always loved. And just in the last couple of years, like the last three years, I've gotten back into an art practice myself. Um, I like to work with natural materials. I call it forest art. So um, working with moss, with, um, with rocks, with sticks, with leaves. Um, I collect and dry and press flowers and use them in it and create these mixed media pieces. Um, so that's a really nice thing to do. Also, you can do those kinds of things outside with natural materials and you just leave it there. Um, so it's, it's a natural piece of art that, um, you know, is temporary and will change over time as the animals and the weather and everything move through and shift it. So that, that's a really, really neat practice too. Um, I do a lot with alcohol inks. That's actually my preferred medium as an artist. And that is a great medium for art therapy because it's abstract and um, you can't control it. It's going to do what it does. Um, it's not precise. And you'll create the best pieces if you can learn to roll with whatever's happening instead of trying to force something to conform to what you thought it should be. And that's a whole therapy session all in itself, right? So I think those kinds of experiences would be really cool. Um, I absolutely love yoga. I've been practicing yoga for about five years it's been suggested to me by many people that I get certified in, in yoga training. Um, and uh, you may remember, if you're a longtime listener, um, me having the founder of Breathe for Change on the podcast. So they actually offer yoga certification specifically for educators. It's a really cool program. So I thought about going through that. But I think if I was doing a retreat, I would prefer to bring in an outside yoga teacher. Um, mostly because I'm not confident enough in that area yet, but I may be by the time we do these retreats. Um, and also because anything that involves 
people's physical safety. Like I really want a serious pro there. You know, I don't want anyone getting hurt on my watch. So those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking, you know, guided hikes, um, forest bathing, the sound baths, the art therapy, um, you know, maybe some journaling. I don't know. I'm, st- I'm just still brainstorming. But here's a really, really cool part. So my husband and I have always wanted to own land. That's always been a dream of ours. Um, you know, I've lived in condos and apartments pretty much my whole life until 2013, until 10 years ago. My husband and I were living in a studio apartment in Brooklyn, (laughs) which was about as fun as it sounds, sharing, you know, two grown adults with all of their things and a cat sharing a, you know, 500 square foot apartment. We needed more space. We could not afford more space in the city. And we ended up getting a house um, out in the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania, um, which is way more affordable than New York City. I mean, it especially was back then, too, when we first purchased. Um, So it's about two hours outside of the city. And over the years, I've started spending more and more time out in the mountains versus in the city. And um, I have just, I feel like I have uncovered so much new knowledge and so many new skills being back out in nature and learning how to take care of land. I mean, I never had any interest in gardening. When you rent, first of all, you're not going to plant anything. You know, even if I had a yard, I wouldn't have. So here was like the first time I'd actually owned a land. And I can look out at the trees and be like, those are my trees. Like, I'm the steward of those trees. I can cultivate this land and make it like a welcoming place for the wildlife, for the birds, um, for all the plants that are growing. And so just learning about native, um, you know, native gardening and not using any pesticides, no lawn, um, definitely part of the no lawn mo- movement. Um, you know, no, um, no lawn mowers or uh, weed whackers or anything like that. It's all very natural. And I feel like that has softened me and helped me connect to wisdom that I feel like is lost. Things that our ancestors knew and passed down from generation to generation. And um, we've lost it. I don't have anyone to teach me these things anymore. Um, and so I've kind of had to learn them myself. And um, it's been a process of sort of like returning to something that feels very human and very sacred at the same time because it's a connection to the past and it's a preparation for the future. So I've learned to have a really deep connection to the land and, you know, learning about the people who were on this land before the Lenape and what were their ways and what were the resources that they used and discovering that, for example, We have mostly oak trees here. And last year, more acorns fell than I had ever seen in my entire life. This is something that I probably wouldn't have even noticed before because I was just so busy. But because I try to be outside as much as I possibly can, I noticed, I was like, wow, what are all these acorns? And um, again, because this isn't generational wisdom passed down anymore, I went to Google And I discovered that oak trees have to collaborate in some way that that scientists and researchers don't fully understand. And maybe like a communication through the root system um, underneath the forest floor, or it may just be that they're all responding independently to the same signals in the environment. But for whatever reason, however it works, they all drop more acorns the same year because if each one dropped more acorns in a different, in like whenever, whatever year they felt like, you know, this tree dropped them this year, this dro- tree dropped more next year, the squirrels would eat them all and they wouldn't have a chance to reproduce. So every few years, it's like every three to six years usually, they will all drop more acorns. And this past fall was that year. And so I was out in the garden um, earlier last month and I'm like, there's a little baby oak tree it was like three inches tall with like four little leaves off of it it was the cutest thing i'm like here's another here's another like look at all these new trees look at all this new life 
that I get to tend to and steward and take care of. It just is, it's thrilling to me. And I would love to share that with other people. And who better to share it with than other educators, than other people who are passionate about sharing their learning and their wisdom. Everything that I teach to you, you go teach to other people, right? Like, I just think that would be so amazing. So um, my husband and I have always wanted to buy more land. You know, we have like three quarters of an acre with our house, but I mean, we wanted like acreage. And um, we ended up finding a piece of land that's only about 10 miles from our house or so. It's 19 acres. And it has a view of the mountains. And it has big rocks and big trees and deer and wild turkeys. And it's just so peaceful and so lovely. And what we would love to do is build some kind of retreat center there, specifically for educators. You know, I think we could rent it out to other organizations and other groups, but I would like to lead um, educator retreats there. So I don't know if we would do tiny homes. We thought about building yurts there. Um, I don't know. It's all still in, in the dream phase, especially since I feel like just the price of everything is so much right now. Frankly, we don't have the money for it. Like, this is just not something that's feasible right now. Um, you know, and it would be quite expensive to build. It would be a long time before we got our money back. And it would basically be a labor of love. This would be part of our legacy because my husband also shares this passion. Um, you know, he's a musician, but he has also, he uh, started a, a music school after 9-11 um, for children who were living in that area down in Battery Park in Manhattan um, to help them work through uh, the trauma of, of living through that terrorist attack. Um, and so he worked with, with children. He's worked with kids who have autism as well, doing music therapy with them. So, you know, he has a real heart for, for teaching and for kids. Um, his sister was a special educator. Um, my sister, my sister-in-law, was a special educator in New York City for over thirty years. She has a PhD. She's phenomenal. I mean, just the most amazing teacher. So he's been surrounded by teachers his whole life, and he just feels this really deep connection to it. And um, you know, anytime he's gotten to spend time with me when I go to conferences or I'm doing speaking events or professional development, and he gets to go, like he just loves to be around teachers. So this is something that we see as part of our legacy. Maybe not like a money maker and probably like a money pit, especially at first, which is why it's not happening right now. But I mean, we have the land, we have the place for it. And because I have the place for it, I can envision it. And I feel like every year I'm developing more skills that would make me an ideal facilitator for something like this. So um, it's just really energizing. I'm sure you can hear it in my voice. I just, I think it would be a really, real, really cool thing to do. So that's sort of a long-term goal. That's something that I would like to do, um, I don't know, five years from now, something like that. But I don't know. I don't even want to put a time limit on it because I feel like what's going to happen is the right connection is going to fall into place and things are going to start to make sense and we'll see the opportunity and we'll be able to move on it. So that's something that I would really, really love to do. So I think this is the right place in this episode to transition into talking about the future of schooling in general and the future in general. And I know that there are many things in the future to be worried about. And what I don't want to do is contribute to that in any way. You know, a big part of what I want to do through the Finding Flow curriculum is addressing student apathy and hopelessness. Because I feel like if you can help kids tap into their joy and their intrinsic motivation and to learn about themselves and really value and appreciate themselves, then that kind of addresses it. But I think that apathy and hopelessness is something that a lot of adults are facing right now too. I think in many ways, the kids who are feeling that way are sort of absorbing that from the larger culture, from social media, from the news, from their parents, maybe from even their teachers, just feeling like 
the world is going downhill. It's not going to get better. So I want to share a different perspective to that. And I want to say up front that I don't mean to minimize the suffering, the heartache that people are facing due to, I mean, just one example, just natural disasters, just climate change, right? Just wildfires and that sort of thing, hurricanes. I don't want to downplay that. Um, And I also don't want to act like we don't need to act, that we can just continue down this path that we're on as a society and everything will be fine because I don't think that's true. I do think that major changes need to be made. But I don't want to focus on that here because I feel like, you know, action plans and also, you know, negative predictions about the future are kind of everywhere. And I want to just, I want to give you an additional perspective to layer on to that. So yes, let's do the work to change things. Yes, let's acknowledge that there are problems and consider this perspective as well. I feel pretty confident that artificial intelligence, generative AI like ChatGPT and you know the tools that generate images and video are going to completely transform our society over the next five to 10 years in ways that we cannot predict right now. And for that reason, I feel like less confident about, I don't want to say predicting the future, but almost like planning for the future. You know, I used to feel like I could kind of project a couple years out and and make an estimate about what might be relevant, what might be necessary, um, you know, what would be a good direction to go in. And now I feel like not only do things change really frequently, but they change in really unpredictable ways. And I feel like AI is really contributing to that. So I return to what I mentioned earlier about being committed to staying curious and open and discerning, to not immediately writing off things just because there is some bad to it. There's clearly going to be many, many bad things about AI. Um, But to finding the good as well. And shutting down, pretending like something is not happening or disregarding it is not going to change anything. There have to be people who are willing to speak up about how to use tools in ways that are good for our society and our culture and, um, you know, positive forces in the discussion and driving those conversations rather than just people who are out for profit or, you know, bad actors, basically. So um, I'm open to AI. And I would like to hope that ChatGPT and tools like that can help teachers automate the more mundane aspects of their work and um, also help them differentiate more easily. I can see, you know, an AI chatbot being a tutor, for example. You know, if a student can't solve a math problem, rather than the teacher having to sit down with them individually to teach them, they may be able to work with a chatbot um, who can walk them step by step through the problem. And that may seem implausible now, but I don't think it will in the future. I mean, there are already companies who are working on um, like versions of stuffed animals, basically. So the student isn't just typing and staring at a screen. This is a screen-free experience where, like, do you remember Furbies back in the day? Something like a Furby and the child can talk to the Furby and say, I don't understand how to do this math problem. And the Furby, which is then powered by artificial intelligence, is able to talk to the child and help walk them through the problem. Like I can see things like that coming along um, in ways that just would blow our minds right now. So I think there are some really cool things that could come out of this. I am not super worried at this point about AI replacing teachers. I know that's a big fear. Um, Now, this doesn't mean that districts may not uh, attempt to, but I think we saw, I mean, we've been hearing for years that eventually computers or robots or whatever were going to replace teachers. And I think we saw during emergency remote learning in the early days of the pandemic, there is no replacement for an actual live human being. Even if you have the best teacher in the world on a computer, that does not mean the kid is going to sit there 
and focus and learn and do the work. The human interactions, the human connections, the rapport, motivation, all those things matter. So um, I, I just, I don't see a world in which we just have kids working with AI to learn because I just, I just don't think that the nature of humans and the nature of children is to sit with a device and focus, you know, on really, really tough problems like that. I, I just, I think it could be a supplementary tool, but I just think the human teacher face-to-face -face with students is just, um, it's irreplaceable. So I don't have that fear. And I could be wrong, but that, I'm just sharing what my thoughts are there. And I, again, I like to choose a more optimistic perspective. Let's look for ways to use AI to make teaching uh, more effective and efficient and to streamline some things and um, to enhance the work, to accelerate the work, as Dr. Monica Byrne says. So um, I would love to see teaching return to the parts of the job that are more rewarding. And I think with AI, there's a possibility that could happen, right? That, that some of the things like, you know, composing emails to parents could be sped up through chat GPT, data entry, um, again, differentiating for, for students. I think some of the things that really bog teachers' time down could be um, streamlined. And my hope is that that would give teachers more time to focus on the actual connections with students, the higher level thinking, the projects, the the, the giving, um, you know, feedback and the conversations, the, the, the tending to students' socio-emotional well-being, which is just so necessary and teachers don't have time for. So um, I would like to see some positive things come out of AI. And so, you know, I'm, I want to be part of that conversation and I want to be forward-looking in that way. But zooming out even more so than schools, I want to just look at society in general, because here's the thing. If we look at what's happening in schools right now, there is a lot to be discouraged about. And things could get worse before they get better. However, I still think that we are so fortunate to be alive in this time. And that's the piece that I want to really drive home to you today, that even as we think about all the things that are going wrong, how many wonderful things there are happening right now and that are ahead for us. Every people group throughout time and history has had their own unique challenges to solve. And it seems like our problems are getting more complex, but our solutions are also becoming more complex. And I think we have to be willing to understand that there's always a flip side to everything. You know, I did a podcast episode a while back with um, Kara Lowenthal about the human ecosystem concept that she came up with, where you can't just change out one bad habit or one bad attribute about a person without fundamentally disrupting the entire ecosystem of who they are. So for example, you know, if your partner's always late for everything and you're like, oh, if they could just be on time, well, if they were on time, they would be a completely different type of person because they would have a different relationship to time, to other people, to their priorities. Like it would shift so many things and create this ripple effect that is going to bring a new set of problems. So now you don't have to deal with their lateness anymore, but now there's this other thing about them that's going to drive you crazy. And I feel like this idea of like, understanding that everything is an ecosystem and everything is interrelated is super important. As much as we're trying to strive for a more ideal, utopian existence, we have to accept that the bad comes with the good. Any good that you have is going to have its flip side. It's going to have the problem that we have to grapple with. Anything good in your life is also going to come with problems. If you think about what we want to accomplish in our lives, right? Like, you know, if you're single and you want to get married or you don't have kids and, and you really, really want to have kids or you don't have a job and you're looking for a job, each time you move to this new stage of life, it brings a new set of problems, right? But that doesn't mean that all of those things, that, that partnership, um, having children, that, that having a satisfying career doesn't mean these things aren't worth it just because they bring a new set of problems. 
And I think that's how we have to think about the progress that our society is making, that there is good and bad. It is interwoven. And each time we fix one of the bad things, it triggers this whole ripple effect that we may not see. As we attempt to reform our systems, as we attempt to do schooling in a new way, policing in a new way, incarceration in a new way, we're trying to come at these things with more perspectives of equity and justice and things that maybe weren't in the forefront of the conversation. There's going to be bumps along the way. We're trying to do things as a society that have never been done before, that have never even been imagined before. That's not going to be a smooth process, especially since there's always going to be a huge percentage of the population that is anti-progress, that doesn't want to even do these things as resisting it, as throwing sand in the gears and making it as difficult as possible and setting it up to fail, which is kind of what we're seeing in our schools, right? A lot of the people in charge of schools don't actually support public schools. Um, You know, they, they benefit from seeing poor test scores and from teachers quitting for various reasons. So my point is, I think we have to expect that any kind of disruption to the status quo is going to come with repercussions that maybe we did or didn't anticipate. There's going to be um, positive outcomes that we didn't see coming, and there's going to be a new set of problems created. That doesn't mean that we stop pushing for progress, that we just settle for the way things are, or that we try to go back to something that we had before that could never be recreated. I think we really have to stay focused on the fact that the good and the bad are interwoven. And sometimes what seems good to one person may seem bad to another and vice versa. Any kind of change creation is going to be complicated. But ultimately, the problems that we're trying to solve right now as a society are worthwhile problems. They're valuable problems. They're the good kind of problems that help us create a better world. You know, they, they have that saying that if everyone put their problems in a, in a bag, they would grab their own back out, right? We would never want to have other people's problems. And I feel like this is true for living in other eras in history. You know, so, I mean, take healthcare, right? So rural hospitals are closing, big pharma is a problem, all these kinds of things, yes. But if I could live in another time, I'd still pick this one because of the medical advances. The fact that we have robotic surgery, the fact that there's new forms of chemo that doesn't make all your hair fall out, all the things that scientists and doctors are learning, like the medical care that we can get. So every time I'm tempted to complain about the cost and about the bureaucracy and just all the shortcomings, just remembering, you know what? There's no other time in history that I would want to live. We are so fortunate to have access to the scientific developments that we have in 2023, right? If you watch period dramas or you read about the past, and I I love reading about different time periods in history, you realize how many common ailments were just completely untreatable. Like an abscessed tooth would take you out. Um, You know, King Tut had all the medical advances and wealth available in the world during his era in, in ancient Egypt. But new research shows he may have had a cleft palate, a club foot, and heart abnormalities. And that's what caused him to die at age 18. These are all things that we can treat now. So yes, we may have to wait a long time for care. We may be overcharged. But how much better to live in an era in which our collective task is to make good treatments accessible and affordable rather than just hoping someone can invent a new treatment. I also can't imagine being a woman in any other era in history. I mean, just being in control of my own reproduction is huge. Yes, there are all kinds of issues happening with that, with rights being rolled back. But how many countless women before me had no choice but to risk their lives through pregnancy, you know, 10 or more times in a lifetime? Better to live in an era where these kinds of... um you know, where something like birth control exists and the need is to make it accessible and affordable, that's a better problem to solve, right? Like, I would much rather fight that fight than to not even have that access available. You know, I mean, I'm a woman who owns a business. I wouldn't have been able to do that in any other time in history. 
So as much as I can talk about how, you know, we still have a long way to go for women's rights, I wouldn't want to live in any other era. And I think this is likely true for people of color as well, right? Like, there are still awful things happening. There's still lots of injustice, but you're more likely to get justice now than any other era, right? Like, when was it better? (laughs) When was it ever better to be a Black person in the United States than today, you know? Um, we have cameras now. We have video cameras to record stuff that's happening and people will post it on social media and there will be protests on your behalf and um, more and more people advocating for equal rights in ways that just weren't true before. So I try to keep that in mind when I see, you know, more horrible things happening on the news that, again, this is probably the best time in at least American history to be a woman or to be a person of color, despite the problems. And I think sometimes people look back at, say, the 1950s, or even the 1980s, and say, well, that time was better, because Americans were more united, or it was a calmer time, it was a more prosperous time. But I would not have wanted to be a woman then, I would not have wanted to be any person of any marginalized identity, I would not have wanted to be LGBTQ, in the 80s compared to now. I would not have wanted to be an atheist in the 80s compared to now. And I mean, the 50s were absolutely not a better time if you were black and living under Jim Crow. So whatever fantasies a person might hold about a past era are just that, it's a fantasy. Society only worked for a narrow group of people back then. And I think we're trying harder now to make life better for all people, not just this narrow demographic. And that's something to be hopeful about. That's something to be positive and encouraged by. I mean, when I think back to the 80s and 90s, how much harder it was for women and minorities to advance in their careers. It just, they're just, the the glass ceiling is still there. But it's changing. I think we're moving in the right direction. And we also hear people sometimes talk about how life was simpler without the internet and how much better things were back then and I can empathize with that too, because, you know, I find it frustrating that our phones are always interrupting um, time with family and friends. It's so hard to just be totally present and not have someone distracted by a screen. But I'd rather have the technology available and be tasked with figuring out how to make it a responsible part of our lives and our society than to just not have it. I like having GPS on my phone so I don't get lost. I like being able to call for help and have my location pinpointed in an emergency. I like being able to connect with other like-minded folks around special interests and and niche niche interests that I have um, that just wouldn't have been possible before. As much as the internet can be isolating and be bad for our mental health, it also allows us to stay connected to people who um, can encourage and support us in ways that we couldn't have before. So I think we can't just focus on the problems of today um, with the internet or with anything else, because if we're only focusing on the problems, then we lose sight of the big picture of all the benefits. These things just become part of our ordinary lives, and we don't realize how extraordinary they really are. In school, kids have more choice. We give more accommodations for the neurodivergent rather than trying to force them to fit into the box of the neurotypical kids. We have more equal outcomes for kids on the margin. Yes, we have all kinds of problems in school, but look at the bigger picture. I would not want to be educated at any other time in history. School was boring in the 80s and 90s. I mean, we sat there in history class and we took notes on dead white men and we memorized dates. It was drill and kill all day long in math class. And I didn't understand anything in elementary school because we never use manipulatives. I never understood why four times four was 16. So even though there are many things that are almost undeniably worse about school today, I'd rather have these modern problems to solve. I would not want to teach the way I was taught. The technology, the personalization, the differentiation, All of these things that are available to kids now is just incredible. The sheer volume of books and texts and learning strategies that are out there is just mind-blowing. 
when you think about it, I mean, there is a methodology for every student. There is a book for every student's interests. And I would rather have the challenge of harnessing these tools for good and mitigating the bad than not have these tools at all. And I think this is the paradox of modern life. Society is becoming increasingly more complex, and there are more and bigger problems to solve than what our ancestors faced. And yet, it is a privilege to solve these problems versus the problems of our ancestors. I think there are very few people in history who, if they were given the choice to live in our society today or theirs, I think there are very few people who wouldn't look looked at our electricity, our running water, our cars, our planes, our internet, the availability of food, and thought, no, thank you. No, no, we don't need hospitals. We don't need doctors. We don't need any of those things. We're content to spend the majority of our time just trying to survive, just trying to find food and water and stay alive. Like we are so privileged to be here in this moment in time. And even when I think back on those indigenous societies, which may seem utopic in many ways, you know, and and things were better in many ways than they are today, we couldn't replicate that today. We, We can't go back. We can't go back to any society that existed before. And the reason that those societies function well the way that they did was because they didn't have many of the things that we had. If they'd had the internet, that would have changed everything. If they would have had cars, that would have changed everything. Their society wouldn't have been the same. This is the trade-off. We have all of this technology and scientific developments, and, and these are now the problems that come along with it. So we can't go back, and we certainly can't go back to a fabricated version of a time period in which you know, magical thinking leads us to believe that things must have been better. Many things in our modern world and in our schools are obviously worse, and that's undeniable. But let's not get so caught up in that truth that we ignore the other truth, that living in this moment presents more opportunities and possibilities than probably any before it. And I think there's so many privileges that we have today that we don't even realize. Like, You know, women in the U.S. couldn't even open their own bank accounts until 1974. 1974, a woman could not have her own money. Did you know this is part of the reason that women have always um, tried to keep uh, nice jewelry? Because if you have nice jewelry, like back in the day when like pearls were a thing, it was because if you ever needed to leave home, you had something on your physical body that you could trade in for cash because you could not be in control of your own money. And thinking about voting, you know, we say that women got the right to vote in 1920. No, not all of us. Black women didn't get the right to vote until 1965. So all women were not able to vote until 1965. And that's only because of the Voting Rights Act, which is, of course, now being rolled back by the Supreme Court. So I think we have to have an eye on history, an eye on how far we've come. I think we have to um, advocate to be able to keep these kinds of things. But I don't ever want to get into this mindset where there was some time period in the past in which things were somehow better. Because I think that when we start romanticizing eras that we did not live through, we can't possibly know the full story. And I think that they would have had problems that they needed to try to solve and challenges that they had to address that we don't even think about anymore. Like I can't imagine walking into a bank and being asked, where is my husband or my father so that I could, you know, make a withdrawal. That is, it's unbelievable to me. So when I start to see too much depressing news, you know, and I'm surrounded by too many people saying, you know, this is just the worst ever. And you know, we're never going to be able to reverse this. We can't come back from this. This is so terrible. Like, you know, I really think you could say that about any moment in history. And I, for one, want to rise to the challenges of my era. I am here now. And this current present moment is the time that I was gifted. And it's a time that you've been gifted too. 
And I think we can do something with that. We have more opportunities now than ever. And I can say that for sure as a woman. There are more possibilities for my life now than ever before in the past. And I don't want to waste that. And I don't want to let myself feel hopeless by focusing on all of the things that seem to be in decline and all of the unsolvable problems in the world. I want to stay focused on this era in which I'm living. I am here now. Every single day is a gift. I want to continue to learn and grow, and I want to continue to share with you all of the things that I'm learning and experiencing, all of the things that make me optimistic and excited and encouraged. I want to keep sharing those with you. So thank you for being here. Thank you for valuing what I bring to the table. Thank you for caring about my ideas, for encouraging me. And thanks for continuing to grow with me. We can do this. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.